Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we have the entire restoration process of a Northern Electric Baby Champ radio receiver from 1946. Lots of detail in this video for you. It's a really great performer. You're going to see that in the end when we try it out after this entire restoration, and it is a pretty big restoration. So I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. This is the little Northern Electric Baby Champ radio receiver from 1946 that we're going to bring back to life today and make this thing work the way it did when it rolled off the factory production line. The case itself is in pretty good condition. It has the typical white paint overspray. I don't know how all of these brown Bakelite cases always seem to find white paint overspray over the years, but uh, this one has some white paint overspray on it that will end up cleaning up. A sticky surface there that uh, somebody stuck something on here. Other than that, the case has no cracks and it is in fairly nice condition. One other thing I should mention about the front here is uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of models out there with this neat little design on the speaker that only have two knobs. The one with the three knobs means that it has the short wave band in it. You can see the short wave band down here, which is a nice little feature. So if you're going to look for one of these baby champ receivers, always look for the three knobs. That's the one that uh, at least I prefer, unless of course you just want the uh, AM broadcast band. That's a little bit more excitement to the radio receiver. You can listen to signals from around the world on short wave. Prehistoric internet, right? So the back side of the radio receiver is in pretty nice condition. You can see people have been in here before and the cord does not look original. That'll get replaced with something safer and I'll talk about that. The antenna lead is coming out of the back here. That wire feels like it's pretty old. So we'll take a look at all of that. So in order to get working on this thing, you need to get this out of the case. And in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is remove the knobs because this will just slide out of the backside. You also want to be very careful around this little plastic bubble window. So if you're going to ever set this on the face, make sure that there's nothing sharp on the surface and make sure the surface is, you know, nice and soft. If you push this in or dent any corner of this, uh, you're going to have a permanent dent in that little plastic window. So it's very soft. As you can see, I can, I'm pushing on it right now can move it in and out just by doing that. All right, so to get these off, basically you just give them a pull and uh, that's not too bad. So there you go, antique dust. These actually aren't too bad. Sometimes they really fight. In times where they do fight, sometimes you have to put a cloth in here and you get some pliers that have a, a bent nose, like kind of like needle nose, but bent needle nose pliers, and you get in there, you can kind of pull them off like so. It'd be very, very careful though, because you don't want to mark up the bake light cabinet. And to get this out, I will grab a screwdriver here. And again, this looks like this has been, those are actually kind of loose. So these are all different. So I'll end up cleaning that up as well. This one looks like a combination of, of a slot head and a Robertson type of screw, something that you'd find in an electrical box or something like that. This one, so it's that's very long as well. You can see that there. Yes. Robertson and a, it's a standard slot there. Uh, one thing you want to be very careful is that if the screws don't thread nicely into the Bakelite, don't force them, or you'll end up doing what happens to a lot of these. You'll put a crack in the case and um, then you're doing a lot of work on it. Now, one of the saves for this is, uh, this one here was just a standard brown bake light. There is no paint on it, but this, these things also came in an ivory color. And um, if they came in an ivory color, that gives you your save. So basically it's just painted bake light. So if there is a huge crack in it, a lot of the times you can fix it with epoxy and then sand it or even use automotive body filler. And uh, do a lot of work on the cabinet, but um, you know, you want to avoid that if you can, right? All right, so these things should just fall out of the back here. So what I'll do is I'll put this on its back and I'll lift this straight up like so. Just move that out of the way. Lots of antique dust in there. And inside it's actually looking not bad. The speaker is looking very good here. So that can just be moved down and glued. There's some dead bugs down in there. Some dust and dead bugs that will need to uh, be removed. And on the top side, the chassis just looks like it has a coating of dust. 
so that's uh, you know the typical wax on the transformer here you can scratch with your finger here you can see that it's dirt and wax mixed so all in all this is looking pretty good so the antenna runs into these so this is obviously going to be the antenna coils uh, one little trick when you're working on these receivers this is something that uh, you learn over time working on these things is that uh, you'll see this antenna coil has lots and lots of uh, wire on it. You see that there, hopefully you can see that. It has lots and lots of wire on it here, where this one is has a lot less wire. So we're going to have an antenna coil for the broadcast band, and we're going to have an antenna coil for the short wave band. So the short wave band is a higher frequency, so higher frequency equals less turns. So there's less turns of wire on this than there is on this. So immediately we know that this is the broadcast band antenna coil, and we immediately know that this is the short wave band antenna coil. And this would be to tune these coils at the top. We'll go over that in a little bit. It's a standard All-American 5 vacuum tube complement, or very slight variation of. So usually the two glass tubes here, so rectifier, and this will be the audio output tube here, and this will be the detector and AVC, and uh, first audio, and uh, IF amplifier, and then this will be the uh, converter tube basically an oscillator and mixer and on the bottom it's looking very original so it's kind of hard to hold this in this position here so what I'll do is I'll reposition the camera here and uh, stay I'll reposition the camera here and we'll take a closer look at the bottom and I'll explain what's going on here and uh, talk about some of the modifications to make this just a little bit safer and I'll get into the component replacement and we'll make this thing work, give it a tune and uh, see if we can hear anything on the short wave bands too. Maybe we can listen to some signals from across the world on this little old receiver from 1946. Here's a closer look at the underside of the radio chassis here and many of the components that need to be replaced in order to make this thing a whole lot safer, make it dependable and just plain old make it work properly. So one of the biggest failure points in all of these radios and amplifiers and televisions and test equipment and everything is always capacitors. I think it still is a problem today. It seems to be uh, capacitors are, uh, are the thing that fails and everything. And then, of course, it destroys other components. In this case, these are paper and foil type capacitors, not to be confused with paper in oil. So there's a lot of confusion there. And I think that comes from the term leakage. So people, when they talk about leaky capacitors, people automatically picture the capacitor leaking a substance like oil. Well, when people talk about capacitor leakage, most of the time, it's an electrical term. The capacitor itself is leaking DC across it when they start to fail. That's the failure point. And then when they leak DC across them, what they do is they get hot, they boil the wax, and then blow the end out of the capacitor, just like what's happened here. And that's what goes wrong with all of these things. So... That particular failure point is known as parallel resistance. So you can look at that as a fictitious resistor placed across the capacitor, not to be confused with equivalent series resistance or ESR. This is known as parallel resistance, and this is a completely different test for these capacitors. Now, whenever you come across capacitors like this, it's not even worth testing them unless, of course, you just want to do it to see how bad the failure point actually is. And I do that quite often. I like to see, OK, you know, all right, this is the capacitor that really caused the failure in here. So if you're into, I guess you could call it radio forensics, uh, that's one of the main reasons to do that. But whenever you see an actual capacitor like this, they all need to go. Now, if somebody's worked on a radio and they say they've sold it to you or whatever and you've purchased one and you've opened it up and you still see one, maybe two of these things in here and they say it's restored or repaired, it's not. They all have to go. No questions asked. They all have to be replaced. So this has to go. This has to go. This has to go. This one has to go. This one has to go. These three have to go. And the electrolytic itself has to go as well. Now, I'll leave the electrolytic capacitor in there for aesthetic reasons on the top so that it looks original. But on the bottom side, I'll put some brand new capacitors in. Many people like to restuff the electrolytic, and that's absolutely fine. So what they do is they take the old one apart and then they hide new capacitors inside it. And that's absolutely fine if you want to do that. 
I like to put the capacitors on the bottom side of the chassis so in the future if they ever need to be replaced it's as easy as taking them out and putting some new ones in you don't have to you know re-disassemble the can and do all that again so when I repair these radios I repair them to use them I don't repair them to fix them and then just put them on a shelf and look at them I like to actually use the radios or if it's a repair for somebody else I like to make these things as dependable and usable as possible so that it will last you know as long as it can so the only variable, what I like to say, the only variable I like to leave behind is the actual vacuum tubes themselves. So vacuum tubes have filaments in them like light bulbs. And of course, you know, filaments do open sometimes. Now, contrary to, to popular belief, uh, the vacuum tube is actually one of the most dependable components in these old things. They seem to last the longest. When I repair these radios, I would have to say that the majority of the radios that I've gone through, all the vacuum tubes are fine. It's always components on the bottom that have failed. And sometimes the components on the bottom destroy the vacuum tubes on the top. So it's kind of a chain reaction. So it's another reason if you get one of these older radios and it hasn't been restored, you don't want to just plug it in. Because a lot of the times, if you plug it in, it's the last time. What ends up happening is, you know, you'll see some smoke. They call it the magic smoke will come out and a capacitor will go away or the filter will short out and then what it does is it destroys the rectifier tube so now you have to buy capacitors and tubes on top okay so i'll talk a little bit more about that and uh, i'll try and find some data on this uh, these radios usually i just go through them and work on them and i uh, get them running and I explain exactly what i do and i really don't need data sheets but i'll, I'll try to find something here so that it will help uh, explain uh, what's going on in here as well and I'll talk a little bit more about safety with these things as well these are known as transformerless sets so they don't have a transformer in these things to isolate the actual chassis from the AC line so that's another thing that needs to be taken note of if you're going to start to try to work on these things you want to learn about them first before you start working on them and learn about that aspect of the AC line because in some of the cases with these radios the chassis itself is tied directly to one side of the AC line and the line cord that's put on the radio isn't polarized so you can plug it in either way so you have a chance of plugging this thing in and having the chassis being on the hot side and that leads into a topic of isolation transformers and repair safety as well so that is a complete other video so do your research before you work on these things let me do the dangerous stuff if you're following along you're doing so at your own risk all right just be careful so what I'll do actually right now is I'll try and dig up some paperwork on this thing and uh, see if I can find a schematic and some other data and uh, maybe we can go through that together and I'll explain a little bit more about the components oh here's a little quiz just before we go remember what I told you about the coils on the top side of the chassis all right on the bottom side of the chassis we have two coils here these are going to be the oscillator coils. The oscillator coils will be under the chassis. So using what I told you about the coils on the top side of the chassis, which one of these coils is the, the oscillator coil for the short wave band and which one of the coils is the oscillator for the broadcast band? All right, so here's the answer. Remember, lower frequencies have more coil, so they have a lot more wire on them. So this will automatically be the oscillator for the broadcast band. And you can see that there's a lot less turns on this. You can see this is lots of fine wire here wound. And you see that there's a lot less turns on this. This will be the oscillator coil for the shortwave band. So there you go. You've learned something already just about coils on this. So anyways, I will get a schematic and uh, hopefully I can find one. I probably can't have bothered looking for one. But uh, I'll look for a schematic and stuff and... Uh, See if I can explain this uh, pointing to a schematic and some other data for you. Northern Electric was nice enough to provide a radio service bulletin to whoever wanted to work on their radio equipment way back when. There's enough information in this radio service bulletin that you can actually build this radio from parts and pieces. And people did that way back when. They would grab parts and pieces and build their own radios. And they would even build their own televisions and test equipment and all that kind of stuff. All the ham radio gear, most of it, at any rate, was all homebrew way back in these days. Everybody would build their own stuff. Quite a different time from now. So they would provide this information for you to basically keep their equipment up and running. 
Can you imagine a company nowadays supplying ra a radio service bulletin with a schematic of their equipment, a wiring diagram, or in today's speak, a component layout map, and a parts list with complete alignment procedure? You think you'd ever find that for your modern television or anything like that? Not a chance. Lots of information on here to make this thing operate. Again, the schematic, nice thorough schematic. We'll go over this in just a moment. Talk a little bit about the design and the way that the engineers were thinking when they designed this. Some pretty smart engineers. So a wiring diagram. So if I zoom in onto this, we can already see that they've replaced some parts. I'll just touch the focus here. So pardon the focus hunt for a moment. You can see that all the capacitors are all Aerovox capacitors all over the place. Well, if we look in the underside here, we can see that these are not Aerovox. I'll just touch the focus again, pardon the focus. So these are not Aerovox, they're solar capacitors. So these have been replaced. And uh, this resistor here is a ceramic wire wound resistor that has obviously been replaced as well. That's a modern part that would be replacing this large carbon composition style resistor right there. And a complete parts list telling you the values and everything, even tolerance ratings. And if you wanted to order the part rate from them, you can actually order their little part number and they would send you a little packet with a resistor or capacitor in it. Isn't that nice? Alignment details, in-depth alignment details to do this. Now, these are very easy to align, and I'll show you some shortcuts here as well that'll just make this so much easier. Sometimes people get very, uh, I guess you could say, turned off by these alignment procedures. They look at it and they go, oh, how am I gonna do this? It's so easy. Well, and I'll show you that here. So let's take a closer look at the schematic. I'll get that in focus and in frame here, and I'll talk a little bit about their design. And, uh, one of the nice things about this radio receiver, which makes it a little bit easier of a restoration. One of the things that I immediately noticed about this design, and it just is the sign of good designing. The Northern Electric Engineers really knew what they were doing way back when. Is you can see the line that's closest to the chassis. All right, so this is coupled to the chassis through a capacitor here, and this is chassis ground. So the line that's closest to the chassis does not have the switch in it they put the switch on the other side and that's very very smart because nowadays when you want to replace the line cord on this it makes things so much easier you don't have to do all this rewiring most of the other all american five radio receivers that you'll come across they switch the side that's closest to the chassis and there's quite a big uh, rewiring job and i've shown this in many of my other videos this you can very easily just put a polarized plug and then in order to keep things that much safer, you make the side closest to the chassis solid neutral. All right. So this is fixed neutral now because you have a polarized plug and you're switching the hot side. So basically no rewiring right there whatsoever. Very, very nice. And again, very smart because if you were going to ever use a polarized plug, again, it keeps the chassis closer to neutral. Very, very smart. You can see right here, they have a capacitor in line with the antenna. Way back when, people did all sorts of funny things with antennas in order to try and get reception. So if somebody ever tried to backfeed AC into this thing or anything like that, you wouldn't destroy the antenna coils. So many communications receivers have fried front ends. So they've taken out all the coils because people have done some really silly things with, uh, with antennas, connecting them to all sorts of funny things. So very smart to do this here. Now what they've done here is they use a 35Z5 and a 35L6. Now, where I say that this is very close to your standard All-American 5 design, and it this differs from it a little bit, is most of the time they would just use a 5-0, so 50L6 in this place and then eliminate the resistor here. But in this case, they've actually installed a resistor in line and they're using a 35 volt tube and a 35 volt tube here. So 35 volt means the filament voltage, all right? So that's the amount of volts that it takes to light the tube up to bring it into emission, okay? So whenever you see 12, that means that the filament is 12 volts. So, so 12 SA7, 12 SK7, 12 SQ7. So you can add all of this up, 
right? So, you know, 12, 24, 36, and you can add it all up, but you'll find you'll come out a little bit short. And that's the reason that they've put this in here. So they would normally, again, just use a 50 L6, and that would be absolutely fine. So technically, you could just replace this and get rid of this resistor if you wanted to. But uh, we'll keep it all the design the same and keep the 35 L6 in there instead of putting a 50 L6 in. Just, you know, it just, the, the design is very nice. It's nice and, you know, very well laid out. You know, the way that they explain everything, they show, you know, the broadcast position. So they show the contacts that are connected for broadcast. And then when you click the switch, these move over this way, and then it would connect these other two here to give you the short wave bands. Very standard design, very, very clean. Uh, it's just uh, really good. They're using a permanent magnet in this, so it's not an electromagnetic type of speaker. Just uh, really nice. Just very, very well you know, designed. The way that they've drawn it, you know, the negative side of all the electrolytic capacitors is, would be theoretically, in, the, in this time, attached to the neutral side. Just, you know, just smart. Typical Northern Electric stuff. Very, very good. So now I'm going to get into this thing and start replacing parts and bring this thing back to life. And then we'll go through the alignment procedure and we'll see how well this thing performs. You know, I bet you this thing is going to receive like you wouldn't believe. All right, let's test some resistors here. So let's start with the 22K resistor here. So I'll just uh, adjust the range on the meter here. And let's see what this 20% uh, 22K resistor is going to test at. 23.3, not bad. Not bad. Now keep in mind that these are in circuit and there might be a bit of noise getting in here as well. So 23.3 is not bad at all for that. Again, 20% tolerance, right? So let's test, uh, let's see which one. Let's test this one, 2.7K. Now this is right across an electrolytic, so... Results will vary here, but let's uh, try it anyways. So we'll call that 3K. Not bad, 2.7, 3K. We're doing all right. Let's test uh, this one here. What's that? Uh, that one is 2.2 uh, meg. All right, so I'll move the scale back up over here this one onto here and clip this one onto here now again keep in mind that these are in circuit so a lot of leaky caps around not bad two point two meg not bad at all so, so far, it looks like most of the resistors are fine. And by, you know, looking at the actual chassis itself and the way that this has been kept, it's been probably stored in a controlled environment somewhere on somebody's shelf. It hasn't been in a garage or an attic. So it's probably the reason that these roundies are okay. Uh, these are very porous style resistors and, you know, they're really subject to moisture ingression over time. So if these are kept in a garage or something like that, they really do move around in value. So just by testing those three, I know that you know, this has been kept very well. And of course, there's no rust on the chassis and, you know, there's very little dust on it. So, you know, that, uh, you know, this has been rather well taken care of. So I think we're going to be probably pretty good for most of the resistors as I'm changing the caps out. And if I do find a bad resistor, you know, as I go along, I'll test all the resistors with the, um, you know, with the capacitors removed and things like that. And if I do find them, I'll show you which ones have been replaced. So when I start replacing the components in here, I just pick a corner and start going. So I'll grab my desoldering tool here. I'll start with this capacitor here. Heat this leg up. Sometimes you need to add solder to these in order to make them work just a bit better. Oh, that wasn't, didn't even have to heat it up. It was just touching there. It was basically tacked into place. I'll heat this one up here and desolder this over here. Sometimes the solder is just horrible stuff, so you have to actually add solder in order to make the stuff let go. Let's put it that way. There we go. So there's one of them that's coming off. In fact, the little paper tube is actually coming off the sealed tight capacitor here as well. So anyways, that's what's on the underside. 
so now what I'll do is I'll just take a brand new capacitor. Actually, what I'll do is I'll probably test some of the resistors that are on the underside of it as well. So that would be a better thing to do. I had another capacitor on the bench here and I just moved some stuff around and now it's gone. Here it is. So this is the one that will end up replacing it. So I usually take some of this piping and put this piping on here and then I'll install that back into place there. And I've also marked the outside foil end on this capacitor. So that's already done. That's done with this little device right here, which you've seen many, many times on my channel. So put this here for a second, just for the fun of it. And let's uh, see what happens here. So this is red, red, yellow, which is 220 K ohms. So let's go from here to here and see what we get. Yeah, that's pretty high, a little higher than I'd like, even though it's a 20% tolerance resistor. And then of course, you know, being nice to it, giving it some, uh, 295 is a little bit too high. So here's a 470 K ohm. So that one actually has gone down in value just a bit, 440 or 455. So yeah, not too bad. I'm not too worried about that one there. This one here f feeds the plate supply of the 12 SQ7. So that's what this one's doing. So you want this as close to 220 as possible in order for the amplifier section of this tube to work correctly. This is 220 ohms. And that's gone up to 240. So yeah, there's a couple values in here that definitely could be changed. This one under here, what does that look like? Looks like another 220 on the bottom there. Let's see if we can get a reading on this one here. So 245. So there are values in here that do need to move. Some, some can stay, some can go. So they're not all that far off, but um, yeah, this one here is, uh, that's definitely out. So that'll be one of those resistors that'll definitely get changed. And this one here, this is the cathode resistor on the 35L6, which could uh, you know, be taken down just a little bit as well. Uh, the new capacitor that will go onto the cathode here, will just go directly across this. I'm not gonna run a lead over to this area. The new capacitors that I'm going to install will be installed right here. So they'll be in this area on a little terminal tie strip. And that'll allow for very easy removal in the future. So that's what I'll end up doing, and I'll also end up cleaning this uh, one terminal off over here as well, the one that uh, that capacitor was just kind of tacked into place. So. This old solder is uh, sometimes really, really hard. So you see, you add new stuff, and then it's absolutely fine after that. So a lot of the times it's kind of hard to get in there. So you can see that cleared the little hole out there. And then the little hole on the top over there is also cleared out where it was vacuumed, vacuumed out. So at any rate, I'll just keep on going. That's basically what this whole thing is. You're just going through and, you know, methodically and slowly taking your time, replacing components with the correct values. And um, in the end, you end up with a working radio. So I'll keep on going and I'll be back when I have most of these all done. The work on the underside of the chassis is pretty much done at this point. I haven't put the line cord in yet because I still have cleaning up to do and I don't want a cord hanging off of this while I'm doing that. I've also removed the antenna wire as well. There's a couple of interesting things to note about this. Those Northern Electric engineers were really on top of things. The screws that hold the, the back piece on, you can see these little screws here, that hold the back on, they're not connected to the chassis. They're insulated from the chassis which is very uncommon for way back when. And I, I thought it was kind of interesting that the back was still intact and it was still there because in a lot of these older radios, not particularly this one, but in a lot of these older radios, the back is always missing. You know, people take the back off to replace the tubes and they get lazy and they don't put the back back on. Well, they've actually soldered the screw to the nut so that you can't remove this. So it's a solid piece. And I would imagine that's the only reason that the back is still on this thing. So this is completely insulated from the chassis. You can see that uh, it has a little fiber washer there. So really the only way 
to come in contact with the chassis is you'd actually have to insert something through this or of course the antenna the lead that comes out that you would run off to an antenna but that's isolated by a capacitor as well now of course those capacitors are long since gone bad and uh, it's been replaced but uh, very interesting very interesting for this particular year most of the radios the all-american five radios way back when you know they had screws on the bottom of the cabinet they'd make everything else insulated but there would be screws on the bottom that would go directly into the radio so you know and things like that this thing is almost uh, completely isolated from from anything so they did a really nice job as i say you know they were really thinking when they put this thing together that is a nice touch you know that they, they, they soldered the screws to the nuts there so that you can't lose the back oh and even the the actual screws that hold the chassis in are held by the back of the radio so when you put the radio back into the case it's held by this again insulated right this this holds the entire thing into the case so pretty interesting so one of the safer designs of the all-american five uh, you know type of radio for way back when so uh, just uh, to show you here, I'll grab uh, an ohm meter. I'll explain exactly what I've done with the with the radio here quite shortly as well. So I'll just turn on the uh, ohm meter here and uh, put this on. Well, you can see it there. Maybe I'll get a little bit uh, better into focus here. All right, so I touch the leads. Actually, I can make it beep too. Let's do that. Let's make it beep. Okay. So if I touch the chassis and touch the screw, nothing. Nothing. So pretty neat. They were on top of things way back when. So it's a nice little, nice little touch to keep this uh, radio just a little bit safer than the other ones. Now, of course, there's been lots of other things that are going to... Well, there's lots of things done at this point, and there's going to be more things done to make this even safer, i.e. the polarized line cord, and, of course, it has safety capacitors. There's a safety capacitor in here, which just replaces their standard paper and foil cap, and there's even a, a uh, safety cap that's going to run out to the antenna connection here as well. So the antenna connection goes up to that little area there and then runs out. So, uh, yeah, just uh, kind of neat to see. So it's going to make it a little bit more difficult for me to clean the backside of this because, you know, this is soldered in place. But I'll get in here and I'll clean all of this stuff out, all the cobwebs out. And I'm going to remove the speaker as well. And that'll help me to get a little closer into the chassis there. And I can clean the chassis just a little bit better. So getting the speaker off is very easy. So you can see I've mounted the two new filter capacitors right here on this terminal tie strip. So I've used one of the screws for the speaker to hold this down. So whenever it comes to replacing these capacitors, extremely simple. Remove one screw and this whole thing just comes right up and you can replace the caps that simple. So designed for, you know, I guess uh, with the future in mind, just in case uh, they ever need to be replaced. Now these are very good capacitors and they have a very, very, uh, you know, high hour rating and uh, good ripple current ratings as well. So. Uh, you know these will probably be in here for the long term but um at any rate to get the speaker out i just unsolder this red wire all right see this little red wire runs up to here unsolder this red wire and then i unsolder this blue wire right here and then take the two screws out and the whole speaker will just come right out of the the set here
So now I'm about to clean this little switch in here. So this selects from the broadcast band to the shortwave band. And I use a product called Tarnex for that. And uh, what this stuff does, actually, I'll keep the bottle tight and I'll just show you here. This is the stuff right here. It's, um, it is a pretty aggressive cleaner. So, so I just take a Q-tip and dip it in some of the Tarnex and then just work away at this. You can already see results. Let me get a little bit better light on that. It also helps to let it sit for just a little bit as well. Kind of hard to see. You have to move the switch around a little bit as well to uh, get it in the, the small areas here. You can already see it's taking the tarnish right off of that. If I can zoom in just a little bit more. Make sure that there's none of this on uh, my hands. So you can see there, it's taking the tarnish off. I should also mention, once you've finished using the product to clean the contacts, you need to very thoroughly wash this area out. And when I say thorough, you need to make sure that there is no residue left behind whatsoever. So I usually wash the area out a couple of times and then I'll lubricate the actual switch itself after that's all done. That's been done right now. So definitely don't forget to do that step. If you use that anywhere on any contacts, you always have to wash it very, very thoroughly after you're done. Fixing this little cardboard gasket around the speaker here is very easy. All you really do is just take some super glue, put some super glue on the cardboard, and away you go. So let's put a little bit here, let's smear it around. Like so. And then just press it back into place. Now I also have for the super glue an accelerator. So I can probably just give it a quick blast of the accelerator and then that'll hold it. A lot of the times the super glue it's, it takes a while, especially on cardboard. So I'm gonna give it just a quick shot of accelerator. There we go. And that fixes that up pretty nice. Once the dial face is clean, the pointer has to be aligned mechanically before any electrical alignment is done. So right now, the capacitor, the tuning capacitor, when it's this side, it's fully meshed. All right, and then when this side, it's fully open. All right, so let's align it on this side. So that's right to the stop there. So all I need to do is put this on and make sure that it's perfectly even from side to side. right about there. Now what I'll do, you can always just give it a bit of a fine tune. So now what I want to do is I want to fully mesh the capacitor and make sure it ends up in the same spot. All right. So yeah, it's very close. I can give it just a bit of a tweak right about there. And I think that would be it. And there it is. So now that's aligned and now it's ready for the electrical alignment to align the oscillator to what the dial actually reads. The chassis is complete at this point, so all the work on the chassis aside from alignment is done. You can see I've installed a line cord, so I've put a vinyl grommet in the back here and the line cord runs through a vinyl grommet. Now from the factory they didn't do that, they have a nice rolled edge. This is the same as this little one over here, they have a nice little rolled edge that they've installed here. And that's usually okay for the line cord, but I just feel better having the line cord run through a soft surface instead of having it make, you know, direct contact to steel here. So that little rubber grommet is a nice cushion. There's two tie straps acting as a restraint, so they're both pulled together and tight on the cord. And before I'm done, this will get a dab of super glue as well. You can see that's very tight, There's no movement there whatsoever. There's a strain relief right here and a movement relief. So there's just basically a, a turn, one turn as it goes down to the bottom of the chassis. 
The neutral side is fixed and it runs closest to the chassis here, so there is no break in the neutral line like in many other AA5 radios. So this is tied directly to this point. It's not tied to the chassis, but it is closest to the chassis. It's isolated from the chassis by a capacitor. The hot lead is running into a fuse. There's a fuse in some heat shrink tubing down here, and then from the fuse it runs up to this switch over here. So if anything was to go majorly wrong, that fuse would go. So it's just a little bit of added protection, another thing that the radio really didn't come with. So I always like to fuse everything. As I was talking earlier, the two new filter capacitors are installed here. Very easy to replace. With the removal of one screw, there's even room left between the resistor here, so you can get a screwdriver down in there, just pop it up, and just desolder both legs, and you can have those capacitors replaced in minutes. So that's nice and easy. There's a uh, another ca a capacitor here. Normally it would have been this one right here, but the cathode capacitor here for this is just tied directly to the cathode. There's no reason to run a wire all the way over here anymore because the this is the size of the capacitor right here, just a really small cap. So all, most of all of the values have been replaced resistor-wise, aside from two resistors. There's one resistor here, which is a 10 meg ohm resistor, which was so spot on, there's no point in replacing it. And there's another one meg resistor down under here, which was right spot on. Everything else I went through and replaced, since I had things desoldered at the point, I was you know removing capacitors and things. So I figured if I've got them both you know, desoldered, why not just pull a resistor out too and put a brand new resistor in. So as you can see, there's a lot of brand new resistors installed all over the place here. So over here as well. So all new caps all over the place here. And one here and this one right here. And uh, this resistor here is nice and close and it's a ceramic value. So I opted to leave that in, which is kind of nice. So this here will probably end up getting pretty warm. So it's, uh, you know, to be found out, I imagine it'll get hot. That's the reason the other one went away, right? It's in series with the filament, so it's bound to get pretty toasty. So, at this point, on the other side of the chassis, let's turn this over here. You can see it's completely cleaned up. And it's looking really nice. So, all that needs to be done now is, since we want to make this thing perform like it did when it rolled off the factory line, we definitely want to make sure that all the tubes are nice and strong. I figure since we want to see how well this thing performed back in 1946, why not just give it a complete brand new complement of vacuum tubes. So these are all strong, they've all been tested, they're right out of the box. So this should give us a really, really accurate representation of how well this little receiver really did perform. Let's see if it'll come to life. What do you think? Let's find out. So right now it's on current limit, as you see up here. And the Bariac is just right to the max. So we should get a little bit of dim bulb glow. I think the switch is on. It is. Here we go. So that's normal. The bulbs that you see glowing here. That's normal for it to be doing that. And wait a few moments here for the uh, tubes to warm up. And the bulbs aren't changing. It has been on here for a little bit, so there's zero sound coming out of that speaker, which is not a good sign, so it's not coming to life. So, let's see here. Usually when there's zero sound coming out of the speaker, that means that, you see this is lighting up just a little bit, so it is coming a little bit better into emission. When there's zero sound, that usually means that either it's something to do with the audio output tube or the audio transformer, because they will buzz or hum just a little bit, in all cases. So, Well, let's see what we can find here. Let's just see if there's any B plus happening on the bottom side of this. So the very first thing I want to do is see if there's any B plus. So this is the ground here. So there is B plus. 
Let's check the plate of the audio output transformer. And there's the problem right there. So the primary winding in the audio output transformer is open. Well, that was fast. Usually is that easy. When the speaker makes zero sound, it's usually that. So now we get to remove the audio transformer and maybe go digging and see if we can reconnect any connections inside there. The wiring to the transformer is very stiff. So it may have worked when I got it. And then of course me taking the speaker off and cleaning it, and moving those wires around just a little bit, I may have actually caused this. So who knows? Uh, let's open the transformer up and see if we can resurrect it. And if not, I'll just have to replace it. I've already desoldered the two leads from the bottom here. So I'll just desolder the two from the top side. And put a screwdriver here. There is the little audio transformer. So I'll get the radio out of the way. Let's see if we can find the issue with this little thing. Since we know that the primary is open in this transformer, there's a really good chance that the winding is broken off the lead out wire. And that's just because these wires are so rigid now. Back when this transformer was made, these wires are very soft and uh, you know, you can move them around with no problems. Well, you know, the wire is, I don't even know if it's a vinyl wire. It feels like a vinyl wire is just, it's hard. So chances are the movement of the wire has actually broken the connection in the transformer. Now, I want to make as, uh, I guess you could say, I want to do as little damage to the transformer as possible. So I either want to open this side, if, this is if the wire is open here, and then fix it from there, or open this side and fix it from here. I really don't want to peel the whole thing back and really start digging where it's unnecessary. So now again, this is just a guess. It could be an actual, in the middle of the winding, it might actually even be open. Who knows at this point? We just know that the primary is open. So what I've done is I've attached two of the probes that I've created, and this is great for finding this kind of stuff. So this here is a signal injection probe, and this here is the Carlson Super Probe. So these are both projects that I've designed and released on Patreon quite a, quite a while ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this probe to inject a signal into the transformer and I'm going to use this to receive it. So essentially this is the transmitter and this is the receiver and this is great for finding open windings. So I'll turn the volume up here to give you an idea. Okay, so so this is the super probe picking up this right now. Okay, so I've got both of them, both of the commons attached to the core of the transformer. And if one of the wires is open and not connected to the windings inside, the signal won't go through this. And basically this will act somewhat like a shield. Whereas if the wire is connected, you know, the winding is winding around here. So I should have more pickup at this side. So what I want to do is put the super probe here, like so. Just like that. And I'll just leave that. I can use the little speaker wire to hold it there. And what I'm going to do is bring this close to each wire, and we'll see which one makes more noise. So we get a bit of noise here. And a lot of noise there. So chances are, this blue wire is the one that's open. So what I'm going to do, let's turn this down. Turn that off. So what I'm going to do now is very carefully get a knife 
and open this one side and see if I can find if the winding is basically broken off of this wire here. So I'll do that here. I'll just get some tools and I'll be right back and I'll show you that process. Well, there you have it. So that's obviously the issue. So now if you look here, you can see the little wires soldered onto it. See it right there, broken? So now we know that it's going to be in here somewhere. So now we'll have to reconnect that. So it's going to be poking up through here somewhere. We'll have to find where that little wire disappeared. That's how fine those wires are. So it may have even come back down this other side. So I'll have to carefully look for that little wire. And see if I can locate it. Oh, that might be it right there. See right here? That might be it. Either that or it's a little reflection using the camera to see this might be it right there looks like it might be so maybe we're gonna get lucky here all right I'll do a little bit more digging and uh, see if we can resurrect this little thing okay so it looks like the wire is still there this little wire right here So what I need to do now is tin the end of this little teeny wire. You can see that there? So I'll tin the end of the wire because there is a, a coating on the wire, right? These wires aren't bare or they would short out the transformer. So there's a coating on it. And by tinning the wire, it allows me to basically burn that coating back a little bit. And then I can test from this lead to here to see if the, it is actually open. So if that was the side that was open or if I just made more issues. Let's find out. So, okay, that's probably T. 
intend. Yep. All right, I'll grab my meter here. Let's see if we're going to be able to resurrect this. Okay, so hold this to here. There it is. Of course, the lead's right on top of the meter, right? Two hundred forty-six ohms. So now I have to carefully. I'll just replace that wire. So you can see, I installed this over top of it. This just very easily slides on here before I put the transformer back inside the radio because the heat of the tube, it actually, this wire was laying on the tube. And I can show you that here. See that? It was laying on that, so I just wanted to put a bit of heat shielding on that. So, who knows, maybe even me putting this heat shielding on, come to think of it, might have even been enough to to actually uh, open that wire, who knows at this point. So what I'll do is I will put a brand new wire in here and go from there. The wire is now attached in the transformer and I've also attached that little lead as you can see right there. So what's happening is I've glued this at the top and I've glued the entire bottom right down to, right basically down to this end here. And I don't know if you can see that. You see how the wire is loose still? So the wire is soldered here, but there's a big strain relief in here. That is just, so the wire is not tight. So if any movement is at this point here, uh, it's not going to snap that wire. If that wire was banjo string tight, it would break here. So now keep in mind, there's a lot of movement here because this is a 300 millimeter lens zoomed right in. So uh, pardon the movement. So you can see that little wire is loose, right? And that's loose right into the transformer up there. So the only place that it's tight is right where it's attached here and it's glued into place. So now that that's all done, I'll put the paper back on and uh, I even put a, a dab of glue on this side as well and uh, use the accelerator on that as well in order to make that wire just a bit tougher because I don't want to have to do this again. So that should uh, be a nice long-term fix. And here is the fixed transformer. So if you recall, I pulled this little edge back and then cut underneath that edge so that I could fold the edge over my actual cut. And that turned out pretty nice. So it looks like minimal interference into the transformer, I guess you could say. You can see I've also flowed some of that super glue on the top side of the transformer here just to hold everything much more steady. So it turned out very nice. Everything went back together and that wire is in there. It's solid. So nothing is going to break there anymore. So take a look here. Start from here to say here. If I can make connections here. There it is, 247. So no problems. So the audio transformer is back in action again. I'll get this installed in the radio and we'll try it out. Let's try again. So the antenna is attached and it's attached to my isolation transformer and current limited variac supply, which you'll see up here right about now. And let's try it again. So here we go. Turn this on. Make sure the volume is up just a little bit. Wait for the tubes to come into emission. I do hear noise in the speaker. It's coming to life. Discovered God's Show. Uh, it was a thousand dollars in research. Website. Alan Brando. Poor girl. He's here. He is cool. We'll be chilly, though. We'll drop down to about six. Trying to be me. That's all I can be. He cut her treatments here. Everything is tailored to you. So far, so good. That is at reduced voltage. So this is, oh, running probably about 90 volts, not even 120 coming into this radio receiver. So 
if I flip this switch up here, that'll bypass all of this, aside from the isolation transformer, and what'll end up happening is we'll get uh, quite a bit more receive even from this. Now keep in mind, this thing isn't even aligned. Nothing's done yet, and listen to the way this thing is receiving. So once the alignment's done, I think this thing really is going to be a champ. So let's get into that alignment. I'm about to align the IF section in this radio receiver here. So on the signal generator, the IF frequency is set to 455 kilohertz, so that's coming out of this cable here. The output level is 50 millivolts, but that's being attenuated by a small capacitor here. It, that's right in line with this little alligator clip. I'll talk about that in a moment. The modulation frequency is 800 cycles. The reason I chose 800 cycles is just because it's easy to hear and the microphone picks it up very well. So it's not picky. You can use 1,000 or 400 cycles or whatever is easy on your ears. It's just so that you can hear it in the speaker. So the signal comes down this lead here and it runs through a very small capacitor. So it's very lightly coupled into the radio receiver. Now, in the instructions, they tell you to couple directly to pin number eight, and this is for a brute force type of alignment using the old signal generator. So they want you to tap right in here. Well, I'm tapping in over here on the other side of the capacitor where it ties to the top side of the chassis to this cap here. So it just makes things a little bit easier. And I'm also uh, just very lightly coupling into this tube here as to not really load the circuit all that much. So I want the lightest coupling I can have into this into this uh, radio receiver. So with that being said, we should hear a tone at the speaker if I turn the volume up. There it is. So it's very light, so you always want to have just enough signal basically to light up the IF section, all right? So you just want enough signal to get through. So if I turn the amplitude down here, so if I go amplitude, amplitude, and I do this, See how it's going away? It's almost not, you can't even hear it right now. So 50 is pretty light. That's a pretty light signal, okay? So now that we have this happening, I need to be able to see when I adjust these little capacitors in the top of the IF transformer, I need to be able to see the difference. I need to see the sensitivity difference. And that's where this vacuum tube voltmeter comes in. So what I'm going to do is attach the vacuum tube voltmeter across the output transformer, the audio output transformer, and as I turn these, it's going to either increase the sensitivity of the receiver making the speaker louder, or it's going to decrease the sensitivity and make it quieter. So obviously we want the most sensitivity possible. So in order to do that, I'm going to clip the common of the VTVM to one of these leads, and I'm going to desolder the other lead on the audio transformer and I'm just going to connect it to here and then I'm going to turn the volume up just enough so that way I get a bit of uh, needle deflection here now some of you might be thinking oh you can't run an audio transformer without a load yeah you can so there's hardly any audio coming through this thing and it'll be so incredibly light it won't even matter now if I was to turn the volume control on this thing up incredibly loud yeah then there might be a problem with the audio transformer but the, the thing's not even working. It's just barely passing any signal, just enough to deflect this. The reason I'm disconnecting it from the speaker is because the speaker really to the VTVM almost looks like a dead short, right? So with the vacuum tube voltmeter across the voice coil here, what's happening is, is the voice coil is, is using up all the energy and it's, you know, making it hard for this thing to see it, right? Because it's almost, you know, again, to the VTVM, this looks like a dead short, right? So if I open the lead, I'll get a lot more meter deflection, and of course it's just going to be easier on everything. I don't have to have it so loud. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, is I'll put this on here, okay, and of course the meter's laying on this right now, okay, so if you see this, this is on this meter's most sensitive setting. I don't know if you can see that down here, okay, so if I put this on here, all right, that's full volume. Okay, right now, that's all I get. So now, if I was to remove this from here, I'd probably have three quarters deflection, which is a lot easier to read. All right, because the voice coil won't be using up, won't be using up all of the uh, all of the drive. Let's put it that way. So I'll desolder this and attach this to this probe here, and we'll start with the alignment. 
I have my probe now attached to the disconnected speaker lead and as you can see I get quite a bit more deflection out of this so that's pinned right there that's the maximum volume so I'll put it about halfway it's always nice to have the meter about halfway and now we need to peak all of these capacitors in here so I'm just gonna look for the best tool that I can find to do this with and I think that would be this one right here and I'll start with this one and we're looking for a max and if the signal gets too high I'll turn the signal generator down so see, look at how far off that is so you turn the volume down you can probably also turn the signal generator down now you're gonna see a little bit of movement here because uh, those capacitors, I might even be able to get a tool that might be just a little better for this. Wow, these are way off. So this is going to have a lot of sensitivity, so I'll turn the uh, amplitude down. Wow. So that's about the max for that one. Right about there. All right, now I'll go to the next one. Let's turn the volume down. We're getting pretty low on signal here. Wow. Okay, now I'll move over to this one here. Turn the volume down some more. Turn the signal down even more. Look at how far off that was. So that volume is way down, and look at where we are on the signal generator, down at 8 millivolts. And that's, again, being greatly even attenuated by this little capacitor. So I'll go over this one more time. It's always a good idea to do that. Of course, just even pushing on these will change it. Okay, so that one's good. This receiver's going to have a lot of sensitivity, way more than it had. All right, brought that one up some more too. So I'll go back to the first one again. And then back to the second one here again. So I'm just going back and forth on this one here. Again, if you pass it, you just reverse the tool and go the other way. Yeah, so we're getting pretty close on that one, so now we'll go to this one here one more time. There. And there. So that was way off. The IF transformers in this were way out. So somebody throughout time has been in here and, and screwdrivered the IF section. So that will greatly increase the receive on this. So next what we're going to do is tune the oscillator and then we'll move our way to the antenna. We're now into the oscillator alignment portion. So basically what we're doing is we're making the dial read correctly. So we don't want to be receiving 600 AM at 1100, right? So we need to make sure that what's displayed on the dial is where it's actually receiving, and that's where the oscillator alignment comes in. So this is the oscillator alignment coil right here. So this is for the broadcast band. Again, the broadcast band is a lower frequency, so we have more turns. And then this is would be the short wave, and there's less turns here because right, it's a higher frequency. So we have two adjustment points. We have this capacitor and this capacitor on the broadcast oscillator coil. 
So our two alignment frequencies are 1400 and 600 AM. So we have to point the dial pointer to 1400 and we have to point the dial pointer to 600 AM in order to make the alignment happen in this thing, all right? So again, we've zeroed this thing, as I mentioned earlier in the video. So when the capacitor is fully meshed, it's pointing straight across. And when it's fully open, it's also pointing straight across. The mechanical alignment is the very first thing. All right. But that's already been done. So we don't got to worry about that. So we see 1400 oscillator trimmer free end. So the free end of the coil is this end. So basically what they're saying, the free end isn't attached to the chassis. So the free end. And then we have the fixed end, which would be the portion that's tied to the chassis. So if we look at 600 AM, oscillator leg item, 42, fixed end. So very simply, remember 600 AM, 1400 AM adjustment. Okay. So we want to see how close to 1400 AM we are. So this is at 600 right now. So we'll go 1400 AM, 1400 kilohertz. All right. And let's take a listen. So I'll move this up. So you can see that's quite a ways off. So it's almost pointed to 1500. That's 1400 AM right there. So as you can see, it's not receiving where it says it's receiving. So now what we need to do is adjust this so that we pick that up again. Okay, so just put the tool in here like so. Get that into there. And there it is. So now we're hearing the dial at the correct area. Now keep in mind, once we adjust the 600 end the 600 kilohertz end of things, what's going to happen is we're going to need to go back and readjust the 1400 because when you adjust this, you can either stretch the dial out or squeeze the dial together so you can actually make this further apart or closer together. So it requires us to go back and forth and back and forth until we make the dial read correctly. So that's technically what it's doing to that coil, all right? So now I'll go to 600, 600 kilohertz, all right? And we'll move this over here to 600 and see if we can hear anything. That's way off. That's at 650. All right, so that's where it's supposed to be. All right. So now we need to adjust the fix end. So we'll make sure we've got some volume happening here. There it is, okay. So now we need to go back up to 1400 kilohertz and see if we can hear this back up at 1400 again. Now you see how it moved that down? That end is now moved down. So we need to go back up to 1400 again. And readjust the free end and we got to go back and forth and back and forth until that reads in both areas and at that point the dial should read very close so there it is back at 1400 let's go back down to 600 and this is what the alignment is like for every radio you got to go back and forth and back and forth so to my eye, that's right on. So that's right pointing at 600. So 600. Okay, hurt. And as you can see, it's off again. So we'll adjust the fixed end. Now back up to 1400. And it's not there again. So we'll readjust this. Okay. 
back down to 600. Well, this is way off. Uh-huh. We're getting close. Probably use just a touch up. That's uh, 600 is this end. Just about to adjust the wrong end. There we go. So that's very close. And I back up to 1400 again. That's right at 1400. this end here. It's right about center. And one more try, back down to 600. If you do turn the wrong one, it kind of messes things up. You almost have to start over again, so keep that in mind. All right, so it looks pretty good. So now let's try about center scale, right? Let's try uh, 900. Let's go 900 kilohertz. Let's see how close this is. Spot on. Look at that. I can see that right in there. Spot on. So that's the. RF align or the uh, oscillator alignment for the AM broadcast band. The next step is to peak the antenna coil for the broadcast band. Now, technically, I want to do the final alignment with this with my antenna connected because you want to peak the antenna coil to the actual antenna that's connected to it. That's usually the best way to do things. So, but for now, I will peak it with the signal generator and it'll get me very close. All right, it'll probably just be a very, very slight movement to get the maximum out of the antenna. Uh, trimmer adjustment with my actual antenna connected. Okay, so right now I have the signal generator set at 1 megahertz or 1000 kilohertz. And I've got the signal coming out 100 microvolts and again the same tone. So 100 microvolts is being coupled through this very very light value capacitor right here. All right, so it's uh, you know, just a touch of signal getting into the, the receiver at this point. So what I'll do is I'll turn this up and I can barely hear the tone in there. The dial is set also to obviously 1000 AM, right? So let's see what happens. That's pretty stiff. All of these adjustments are way off. It's trying to receive a radio station right now with my signal generator attached to it. You can hear them beating together. So this uh, receiver is going to be very sensitive. I'm looking forward to, to listening to some uh, late night distant stations on this thing. Should be a lot of, a lot of fun. All right, so that's done. Now on to the short wave. Now we're on to the short wave oscillator and then we move to the short wave adjustment up here as well. It's now time to adjust the short wave bands. So the very first thing we need to do is adjust the 15 megahertz side. It says oscillator trimmer item free end. So this is the free end here. That's the trimmer. And then we have the coil adjustment down here which will be adjusted at 6 megahertz iron core item. Okay, so that'll be this one right here. So let's see how close we are. We'll take a look at the signal generator. I have everything already preset. So let's find out how close we actually are. I'm very surprised. Very, very surprised by that. That's almost spot on. That would be spot on right there. So we'll give it a slight adjustment. That is actually very surprising. 
So usually I free these all up before I go about adjusting them. So I'll stick this in just before I turn the camera on and I'll just rock them back and forth so I'm not fighting with them on camera because some of them are pretty seized. This one has been not bad. I didn't do it to this one, so hopefully this one is not going to fight me. Let's see here. This one's actually not bad. Okay, so... Now keep in mind that even pushing on this will change this, right? So that's pretty close. That's going to be right on. That's why they tell you to rock the gang sometimes. So it's a tuning gang, and they tell you to rock it. And that's what they mean by rocking it, rock back and forth. So that's spot on 15 now. So let's try 6 megahertz. And that will be over here actually, so let's leave this down. Not bad. It's a little bit low. So right there is spot on 6 to my eye. So now we need to adjust the slug in the center. Okay, so let's do this. Get this in here. Actually, this end will do. Pop that end in. Like so. All right. Wow. Well. Okay, six. There it is. Back up to 15. That's 15 to my eye. Make sure. Yep, 15. And 15 megahertz. And we'll adjust this end again. close. Spot on. Okay, back to six. That would be spot on six right there. Six megahertz. And again, we need to adjust this some more. Make sure that we're not going the wrong way. Nope, that's definitely the right way. And back up to the other dial, or to the 15. we are to this. Getting closer. That's 15. Spawn on 15. Back down to 6. Move this just a touch. Oh, that's so close. In fact, I think that is. That's pointed right at it. To my eye. So there it is. Yeah, it's right in the middle of six. So there we go. So that is the oscillator adjustment for the short wave band. So now we go to the antenna adjustment for this.
The next step is to adjust the antenna coil. Now, they have you do this a little bit differently in the alignment procedure, but uh, experience brings me to doing it this way. So, anyways, let's give it some volume. So I'm back up at 15 megahertz, as you can see. And I'm gonna turn the sensitivity down to 100 microvolts. Again, that's, you know, attenuated again by this very, very light value capacitor. So turn that, we can still hear it in here. So now what I'm going to do is adjust the capacitor on the top here of the antenna coil. And it definitely peaked up. Not much, but it did peak up. So not too bad. So now what we need to do is go back down to the bottom. Where is it? Where that was at uh, six megahertz. Six, oops, I'm adjusting the amplitude here. Let's see, frequency, six megahertz. Okay, go back down to the bottom. There it is, right there. Now what we need to do is adjust the core, which is through the bottom of the chassis right there. So we'll adjust that for maximum sensitivity. Hear quite a bit of gain there. All right, now I'm gonna go back up to 15 and adjust this one here again. Wow, that's really picked the sensitivity of this up. Whoa, see what I mean? So that peaked up even more. So we'll go back. Now keep in mind that just me moving this around is moving this off frequency because as you can see, that's me capacitively coupling to the coil. So that's how sensitive this is. Most of the high-end communications receivers have a metal bottom on them and then you have to poke your tuning tool through the metal bottom cover so that nothing will change this. So nothing will basically couple to it. So there's gonna be a, obviously a Bakelite bottom on this thing, right? So again, it probably won't be much different than this being on the, on the bench here, but it may cause when I slide this into the cabinet to cause this to move oh, a hair on the dial. So not too big of a deal. If I was to put a metal cover on the bottom of this or something like that, it would definitely change this. Again, you know, like, I'm effectively tuning the dial with my hand, kind of like a theremin. All right. So one of the catches with the receivers that uh, don't have bottom metal covers. All right, so anyways, back to six megahertz we go. Lots of receiver knowledge here for you. I could talk hours about all the little catches and things and what brings me to changing around the alignment procedure a little bit to optimize things. And uh, there's just, uh, yeah, done so many of these, done so many com communications receivers at this point, you just, uh, you get to know what works best for what. So six megahertz. Okay, and All right. And that's where the sensitivity is going to be at the max.
Trying to listen to the difference. Not bad. Okay, so now let's check the dial accuracy at about, uh, we'll say 10 megahertz. And listen for sensitivity as well. Should be right around here. Look at that. Spot on. Spot on 10 megahertz. Lots of sensitivity. Not bad at all. So now that this is done, it's pretty much ready to put back in the cabinet and we can listen around the dial and see how well this thing really performs. First, I'm gonna take that Bakelite cabinet and clean it up just a little bit and uh, make it look like brand new. I've been working away at the Bakelite case and this is how it's coming out so far. So I think I'm pretty much done at this case. I'm just gonna put some plastic cleaner on the little plastic bubble window here and I think it's done. Now there is no rocket science to this. All that I've done here is, there was sticker residue on the side and there was some grease and dirt on this so I took some WD-40 and wiped the whole case down to get rid of the sticker residue, works great for that. And the grease and all that just removes all that. And once that's done, you dry it off completely. Now don't get fooled by WD-40 when you spray it onto Bakelite, it usually makes a Bakelite look incredible right away. Well, what happens is once you dry it off, the you know the WD-40 will go away and you end up with a dull case again. So WD-40 is a great cleaning process for this. In order to make it stay shiny for quite some time, what I use is this product right here. No, I'm not sponsored by them. I just find that it works very, very well on Bakelite. So I put this on the Bakelite and it, you know put a whole lot of it on there, smear it around, and then just buff it all off. And you want to buff it off until it's completely dry so that you don't have a greasy residue in the end. And this is what you end up with. And it really is quite simple. You don't really have to work at a lot of this stuff for an incredible amount of time. Just uh, it's the nice thing about Bakelite is it comes back usually with just you know a little bit of cleaning and some wax. So that's that. So what I'm going to do now, you can see there, as quickly as I can wipe this off is as quickly as dust is settling on it. So uh, anyways, don't mind the dust. So now what I'm going to do is just clean up this little plastic window here with some plastic polish. This is the stuff that I use right here. Again, not sponsored, just works very, very well. Kind of uh, the same color as my little rags here. So a nice little light blue color. And I'll sit there and just polish this up, clean that all up, and get the radio back in. We'll take a listen to it and see how well this thing receives. And it'll look great too. Let's take a listen to the broadcast band and see how well it performs. Now, it's somewhat late into the evening, not incredibly late, so the stations that are there are a fraction of what will be there in just a couple of hours. The difference is, is when all of those stations get in there, it becomes quite a pileup and we get quite a bit of a whistle on the band because stations are just on top of each other and they're all over the place. So this is kind of a nice balance between daytime conditions where the band is completely quiet and all you hear is the radio station and night where you get lots and lots of radio stations in here be again because of the conditions and uh, we get to hear kind of a balance of both. Uh, please don't mind the dust settling on the case. Uh, it's in impossible to keep the dust off of this, especially with the way the light is shining. The reason that I have it lit like this is so that we can see the dial. I want to keep the reflection of the actual light that's lighting the radio off the dial. The, the dial plastic bubble dome over the uh, actual radio dial itself, since it is a bubble dome, no matter where you put the light, there's always a shadow somewhere where you want to look. So this seems to be the best balance for everything. So we get to see a bit of the radio and we get to see the dial at the same time. So let's take a listen to the broadcast band and see how many stations there are. Again, if you have a very, uh, you know, I guess you could say a wide audio response on your on your computer speakers or whatever you're listening to on your headphones, you'll probably hear a bit of a high pitch whistle in here and that's between the stations. That high pitch whistle is not there during the day. It's just, again, because there's just so many radio stations, it's, uh, it really is quite hard to keep, uh, you know, to, to keep that out of there. So when I tune onto a radio station, a strong one, you'll hear that whistle go away. So uh, just some things to keep in mind. That's just normal DX listening. All right, so the microphone is about as optimum as it's going to get for making this radio sound the way it should as I'm sitting in front of it, okay? So I'm off to the side of the microphone right now. That's why I sound a little bit distant. I have the microphone uh, element aimed directly at the speaker here. 
So I, I don't know if you could get a more accurate representation over the computer. Again, with the way it sounds on your end depends on your computer's system, EQing and speakers and everything. But uh, if you have it set up correctly, it should sound pretty good. So let's take a listen. Now she prepared a room for Elisha when he passed through that area. And since then... In the season, Eagles, the lone remaining undefeated team, they are sitting at six and zero. And as well, another thing to note is uh, King George. Great and the Philly edition, AFC. Um, not just sports topics uh, and storylines, but also pumpkins and candy. And it's the end of October, which just blows me away. It's after. And look at early November. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Metro Vancouver, Mike. Thank you, Kevin. City News Time. Yeah, I, I can remember reading and reading so forth and so forth. Super causes because that's his job. People's motive. You know, I don't think Anthony Fauci is, you know, trying to. So as you can see, radio stations everywhere. And again, this isn't even the peak of conditions right now. If I tune this a couple hours from now. I won't be able to move that dial just a stitch without hearing a radio station. So this is kind of a nice balance between daytime and conditions. We get to, to hear that uh, the radio perform, you know, at listening to distant stations, and we do get to hear some local stuff in here as well. So I'd say it's about a 50-50 mix right now. And Monday to Friday, 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Okay, thanks, Morley. It's not a competition. I still think I will. Breeze, we'll see scattered showers in the morning. Without selling your home, meet your financial needs. It's buying it. A couple of bags. Five right now. Traffic center. I'm still allowed six and a half yards per play. Their team is bottom 40. Canadian Maple Leafs. America. Increase the odds of knee replacement surgery for both men and women. Awkward a little bit on the ice the way he skates. But man, that can... Mm. Check your credit score. We'll have some basketball to look at. Uh, we've got some tennis. <laughs> November 29th, traffic and weather together is brought to you by Mountain America's special rate offer. This afternoon rise into the 40s, bringing with it those snow levels up. Amazing amount of stations in there. So the receiver is working really, really well. Next, we'll take a listen to the short wave bands. Let's listen to some short wave. So I have the needle sitting just below six megahertz. So we'll take a listen. There should be some action up in here. And then at this time of the day, usually in this portion of the band, it's really quiet. So uh, we'll take a listen anyways and see what we can hear. So let's turn this up and get scan in the band. The Speaker of Parliament, once elected, the new Speaker will conduct the election of a new Prime Minister to be to be decided by members of.
Morse code in there. Here's an example of the time signal at 15 megahertz a little bit later in the day. The conditions still aren't optimum, but it's here. So that's 15 megahertz. And there it is at 10. The dial accuracy on this Northern Electric is really, really good. It's pointing right at 10. And when it was receiving the time signal at 15 megahertz, pointing right at 15. So Northern Electric really did a good job making the oscillator track with this dial. So all in all, I'm extremely impressed with this little radio. It works very, very well. And you can really see Northern Electric really did put the time into the design. So all in all, project successful. Very happy with this little radio. If you enjoyed this video and the detail provided in this video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos like this in the very near future. So there'll be lots of repairs and restorations and even circuitry design on this channel. So if you're all about electronics like I am, this is the place. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. I have an extra 150 videos on Patreon. I have an ongoing electronics course there where I share many of my personal electronic inventions and designs as well. You may want to check that out. I'll put the link just below the show more tab under the video's description and I'll pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.